Are you getting ready to study ancient Egypt? Well, I have a whole lot of resources for you in this video. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm a homeschool mom of a first grader, a preschooler, and a baby. This year, as my daughter is in first grade, I decided to follow the classical history timeline, and we are doing ancient history. I have another video on what I'm doing for ancient history this year generally, and so I will link that above. But today I'm going to be talking about the unit I put together for Ancient Egypt. I am using Story of the World Volume 1 as a spine. This is by Susan Wise Bauer, and this goes from um, prehistory. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have a lot on prehistory, but it starts on what is history, what is archaeology, and it goes through, I believe, 400 AD um, with the end of Rome. So let me just quickly... Give you a look there of what that looks like. We've really been enjoying this. The chapters are nice and short. I've been having my daughter narrate, um, not the whole chapter at once, but chunks as we go. And she's actually, I can see improvement throughout the year as we go. There's, um, obviously it's history told as a story, so it talks about events and people, but it also incorporates some mythology and some stories, which I really enjoy. But I also just didn't feel like it was as much in depth as I wanted to go on some of these cultures because I just love ancient history diving in to learn all the things. So the beauty of homeschooling is I was able to dive in with my kids and we learned a lot more about ancient Egypt. In these units I put together, I have a lot of books and I try to incorporate as many living books as possible. So for me, that means something with a story is better than something that's just um, just informational without the story. So you really want the information woven into something that makes it more relevant for the child. I always try to include living books in my units and also some activities and maybe other resources as well, depending on what I find. Ideally for each unit, I would have books art, activities, and at least one game would be ideal. So in this video, I'm gonna go through the books that we used for resources, the, um, and then I'll go through the art and other activities and resources that I found related to this unit. I have a lot of books, and we did this over the course of four weeks, so I have them sort of generally sorted <laughs> into categories. I'm gonna start with just our general books, and this is stuff we read throughout the four weeks um, they're a little longer. And the first, we actually did this as our read aloud at, in the evening with my husband as well, instead of during school time. This is The Golden Goblet. And it's actually one of my my favorite read alouds that we've done so far. Um, it's about a boy in ancient Egypt and he um, wants to be a goldsmith. So you learn a lot about um, the, the goldsmithing, what, what they did, how they made things. Um, also about stone cutters because his um, brother is a stone cutter, and I won't give away the whole story, but there's there's a mystery and there's adventure and you're really rooting for him. It immerses you in the world of ancient Thebes. So um, I highly recommend this. Again, I have a first grader and a preschooler who's four. Um, so it's probably a little more advanced than a normal <laughs> person would read to a preschooler. I just include my kids. I, I, just, I just tend to read um, books for read-alouds that are above my children's levels for the most part, as long as I don't find them to be like too scary or inappropriate. So um, I didn't find this to be too scary or inappropriate. If you have a really sensitive child, some parts might be a little bit scary, um, but it, it was fine for my kids. And we really enjoyed that. The Treasury of Egyptian Mythology, especially for these ancient cultures, they had a religion that was so different from most religions that we see today. Um, Hinduism, I believe, is the oldest religion. And, and for us living in the United States, that's pretty foreign. There's not a lot of Hindus that we have contact with on a regular basis. So I, I think it's important because it shaped so much of their world for us to learn about the mythology of that culture. So I tried to incorporate that whenever I could. So this is um, a treasure of Egyptian mythology. Uh, warning about this one is some of this is not really kid appropriate. Like it, it I thought it would be. As I went along, I found myself um, editing on the go, if you will, on some things because, um, yeah, some content that I did not feel was appropriate for my kids. So I would look at this ahead of time. I have another book 
that goes into some of the gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt, which might be a good substitute, but it doesn't go in as depth as this one. If this works, just be aware that you may have to uh, leave some things out or edit and adjust as you go. And I wouldn't leave this for an elementary student to read on their own unless you've already read through it and are comfortable with it. But aside from that, it is a beautiful book. It's, um, let me show you, it's just, it has beautiful pictures in it. And it goes through, it goes through different gods and goddesses. And it even has multiple names for them because their names were, after the Greeks came in, a lot of the names that we know them by, um, such as Isis, are um, Grecianized. I don't know what the right word for that is, but the Greeks took them and make them their own. So it has those names, but it also calls them by their Egyptian names. I'm gonna see if I can find the chart for you. Here we go. So there's a little chart in the front. Hopefully you can see that decently well. And um, it goes through this. So I really appreciated that about this book. Um, and, I was, and I was able to explain that to my kids. And it used both those names. We have other resources. Most of them use the Greek names. So it is good that it uses both and not just the Egyptian names because otherwise I would have been confused when they're talking about the same god. That is the Egyptian mythology book that we used. This I found used for really cheap. And so I also have this one, it's Ancient Gods and Goddesses. And it's, um, it also goes through some of the major ones, but it doesn't go through them as in depth. So the, the Egyptian mythology, the other one has stories for each god or goddess, and this doesn't really. And so, but it is, it is, totally totally appropriate so there's trade-offs to that and so that's an alternative if you wanted to use this one instead i will have links to all of the books and resources down below so um, you can go ahead and just click right on those if you're interested some of them may be affiliate links which means that it doesn't charge you anymore it just gives me a little bit so if you decide to shop through those i do appreciate your support another general book that we read we spent the whole four weeks reading it a little bit at a time is Pyramid by David McCauley. You may know him from The Way Things Work. Um, I really like his books, they're fun. And um, this is just about, it's, it's actually told in story form about the building of a pyramid and it goes in detail. So it has these drawings, it's in black and white, but the drawings are really cool. And it's very informational, it's a little dense. And so it's not gonna hold um, it, it may not hold the attention of a child who needs like a ton of action, to be honest. Um, but I got it specifically because my son, he's, he's, he's kind of, sometimes he's, he's interested in building. So he, he likes construction and he likes, um, building and he just, he thought the process was cool. So I got it mainly for him, but, but read it to both of my children. Um, again, my son's four, so he's only in preschool. So it, it is advanced for a preschooler. Um, but I, I really, I enjoy his work. I think it's good to just do a little bit at a time. This is Egyptian Diary Journal of Noct. At least that's that's how I'm saying it. And it's a journal of a Egyptian, an ancient Egyptian boy who is um, not a real journal, it's historical fiction, but it's from the perspective of an ancient Egyptian boy who's learning to be a scribe like his father. And it is told in this, you know, last season of the flood and i believe this is told at the time of hatshepsut um and it has some pictures in but it's it's a chapter book um so i read it aloud to the kids we did it towards the end of our unit in the last two weeks um just again a little bit at a time that's how i like to read a lot of its longer books and um it was they we liked it it, it it's 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 a fast read, it's easy, and there's a little bit at the end, Knox World, that has more detailed information. And uh, we had looked through it, and it was mostly stuff we had already covered, but if it's not something that you've covered before, like they even have a little section on the gods, um, you could just pick this up and it's kind of like a mini Egypt unit in and of itself. So this was a good, this was a good choice, and I think this is really good for elementary level kids. This is a picture book and this is Temple Cat and it's about a cat. So the Egyptians revered cats um, and this one gets tired of just sitting around the temple all day and it has pretty pictures. So, <laughs> so he goes on a bit of an adventure. 
And so you see the temple and how they treat cats, but you also, he kind of wanders around a little bit. And so you learn more than just about the temple. And so I like this one. Picture books are always great. Um, I don't know how long. I hope I'm, I hope I'm using picture books with my kids for a very long time because they are a wonderful way to um, share information in that's easily accessible and often they're also beautiful. So I've had this book, it's How Children Lived, a first book of history, and it has spreads for different time periods. So uh, let me find the Egypt one for you. Well, let me show you here. So it has from around the world in different time periods. And so for this unit, I didn't obviously didn't read through the whole thing, but I just started with the Egypt page. Whoa. I'm not sure if you can how well you can see this, but it, it just goes into different details on a, a particular, obviously historical fiction child in, in that place and time. And then it has pictures of actual artifacts from that time that they may have had. Um, so we just we just looked at it and read through it and it was just a nice little addition. We didn't spend super long on it. To organize all of my books and resources over the four weeks that we studied this, I grouped them into loose themes. So the first week, my focus was on writing, and this is partially because our spine, Story of the World, talked about the first writing. So um, I also have this book here, The Story of Writing, that I'm gonna be using throughout this year and probably next year into Middle Ages as well. And it has, I, I really like this book. Let me show you. The contents there a little bit so it goes through different early writings and um and then into like the invention of printing and everything so um but the way so for each chapter so this is like the first one on sumerians and cuneiform which i did do when we covered sumerians separately um but it um it, it phrases it as you are a young sumerian boy learning how to write and so it it's not necessarily a story, but it's it's told in the the information is told in a way that I feel like makes it more interesting and accessible. And there's lots of there's lots of pictures. So this is the Egyptian chapter that I read during this unit, and it talks obviously about hieroglyphs and how the boys would have learned, not the girls, obviously. Um, it's always an interesting discussion to have with my daughter when she realizes that. Throughout a lot of history, girls were not allowed to do a lot of the things that we do today. Um, but yeah, so so I like I, I like this book quite a bit. Um, I also read part of it for Greece. I wrote for Rome and ancient China. So this is the story of writing by Carol. I want to say Donahue, but I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But I will again. All these will be linked below. So check this one out. Then I got this hieroglyphs book. And I think I had something like this as a child, to be honest. It has um, information on the hieroglyphs inside. And I mean, it really, it goes through the basics. It also has just information on Egypt. And we didn't read through this whole thing because it was very, some of it was very repetitive of other information that we had. Um, but I really used it for the information on hieroglyphs and writing. And it comes with the stencil in the back. So we used that and... Um, I had the kids try to write their names and other things, and I also tried to write my name and other things that we wanted to write with the hieroglyphs, and it was kind of a fun way to make all that come alive. Next category is a little bit more about pyramids. So when you think about Egypt, you think about the Great Pyramids, and um, I got this, You Wouldn't Want to Be a Pyramid Builder, which we again love this series. You'll see this in some, this series in some of my other videos as well. And um, it has a lot of great information. It's, it's packed full of information, but they make it fun with speech bubbles and just the way it's presented to you is, um, it's a little, some of these are a little depressing, especially the ancient history ones, but it, I mean, they're told from, you wouldn't want to be this. So um, from that perspective, it's, you know, you, it tells a story of a person. So in this one, Let's see, you're living in Egypt around 1500 BC. And so it's talking about that. And it's talking about you are somebody who's been being forced by the Pharaoh to work um, to build a pyramid. And my kids love these ones. They will sit through them 
no problem, even though it takes a little while to read through them. They can be a little bit long for like a little one, a little preschooler. Um, but my kids happen to really like being read to, so this works really well for them. I also found this used uh, Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. So this is not specific to Egypt, obviously, um, but it, it goes through several, um, the wonders of the ancient world, and it has beautiful pictures of them. So a couple of these, I think, were Egypt, and then a couple are from Greece. So I'm, I'm using it, again, throughout the year in our study um, here. Let's see. Yeah, that might have been the one Egyptian one. There's a bunch from Greece. But we read that one. Um, the We read more about the Great Pyramids in this one, and then we'll continue using it. One of the first things, maybe even before pyramids, that I think of when I think of Egypt is mummies. So... I have quite a few books on mummies. Um, and I'm gonna preface this with, you don't need this many books on mummies. So these two, these, this is Mummies Made in Egypt by Aliki. And this is, you wouldn't want to be an Egyptian mummy. And I'm gonna be honest, these were both fantastic. You don't need both. They were really repetitive of information. We ended up reading both because again, my kids and I love books. And so we had them and we should read them. Um, I don't, I don't know which one I'd recommend over the other. I'm going to be honest. I really liked them both. I will link them both below. Mummies Made in Egypt. Um, again, it's a lot of great information and cool pictures and goes through the whole process for you there. Um, and you wouldn't want to be Egyptian mummy. It's the same format. It's, um, you know... What happened to your dad? Oh, these books also have these timelines in the front, which is really cool. And I used them to help me when we were making our timeline. <clears throat> but it started dead. Off to the embalmers. And uh, yeah, it just it kind of makes what can be a somewhat depressing or icky subject. And it makes it really funny. Um, of course, kids tend to love icky subjects, so they didn't really need for it to be made that funny, but it, you know, it's, it's always good. Animal mummies. My, my daughter was intrigued by that because she loves animals. So again, I don't think you would need both of these if I were to do it again, but one of them. So maybe whichever one you could find cheaper, you could even go that route. route. Or if you really love the series, go with this one. If you don't, go with this one. Um... Yeah, these are written for, I think, upper elementary age and maybe middle school. So um, this is not something I'm having my kids read alone. I just want to emphasize that I'm reading it to them. So I, I'm fine with it being a little bit above their level. With all of these, again, look over it ahead of time. Make sure you're comfortable. We also had this. I think my parents gave it to us at some point. This is I Am The Mummy Heb Nef Nefert. I don't know if I'm saying any of these names correctly by Eve Bunt Bunting and it's a story of a, it's actually, I found this one really sad because it's it's the story of basically of her life and how she died. Um, it says, I am the mummy Hebnefert, black as night, stretched as tight as leather on a drum. Once I was beautiful. So she's recalling her life, um, which is really interesting. Um, so it's not as much about the mummy process and more about her life in Egypt but I just included it there because it's mummy. And there is the Magic Tree House. My kids love the series, so if I find relevant ones, I throw them in, and they're really fast reads. Um, usually I don't do them all in one sitting because it's just a little much for me, but they, can, they could be done in one sitting, to be honest, because they just fly by. They are chapter books, but they're pretty short. And these are ones that I'd feel comfortable if, I, I would feel comfortable with my daughter reading this herself. And to be honest, she probably could. It would just take her a while. And she's um, not at the point where she wants to push through that challenge yet. So I'm fine with reading it to her for right now. And we own these. Um, we're growing our collection. My dad is helping us grow our collection. He brings a new one every time he visits. So um, I'm hoping that as she gains confidence, these are ones that I'd be perfectly happy for her to read on her own. Again, she, she just turned seven. When we did this unit, she was six and in first grade. So... <clears throat> I think for early elementary level, these could be something, depending on your kid's reading level, that you could assign them to read themselves. 
There's the 5,000 year old puzzle. This is a cool picture book. Now this is told from the perspective of this boy. I don't know if he actually existed, but um, in the story, his parents are archeologists and they're traveling with a famous archeologist to look at tombs in Egypt. So he gets to go spend like a year, I think, in Egypt, you know, with them digging and learning that way. And so <clears throat> it's told from his perspective in, I guess, journal format. So, so it's 1924. And I'm pretty sure like this team, like this star, the main, the head archeologist and the team actually existed. And this is based on their actual journey and what they found. Um, but I believe the boy and his family are, are fictional. Um, but it goes through, you learn a lot. Um, going just through what as he's learning how not only about ancient Egypt but how to how archaeologists work how they um, how they have to cat like um, what's the word how they have to be really careful and record everything as they go um, and that they need permission sometimes and sometimes there's a lot of waiting between things just the big wait here and they find a mystery. And then when they find what's happened in this tomb that they find, they have to try to figure out why the tomb is as it is. I'm not gonna give away too much of the book. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. So it, it ends with you find things, but there's still a mystery at the end and we may never know the answer because it happened 5,000 years ago. So uh, I, I really enjoy this one. So for these historical units, I like to make sure I also have some information on people that we know lived. And so we're really fortunate to have information on some of the Egyptian pharaohs, and several of them are covered in the story of the world. But there's a couple that I just wanted to go into more detail on with my kids. So of course, King Tut. This is a Who Was, this is a Who Was series, um, and I have some more of their books. I I was skeptical about them at first, mainly because I don't love the cover art with the giant heads and like the cartoonishness of it, but I think they're really well done. They have definitely won me over. They're chapter books. I read to the kids. They're pretty easy chapter books. Um, I wouldn't assign this to a first grader, but maybe like a third or a fourth grader. Um, again, kids reading levels are so different, so I hesitate to share a specific level, but um not a very beginning reader, but it's not super hard. So we would do a chapter or two a day. I think we did this in the second two weeks um, just to learn about it. It talks about who was King Tut, but it also talks about the discovery of his tomb because obviously that's <laughs> that's an important part here. Um, and they have little like drawings in there and they'll have little, um, I want to call them sidebars, but like little pages that are just informational on things on on um, related to what we're what we're talking about so this isn't specifically about King Tut this is about pyramids but it's relevant to learning about King Tut so I enjoy these they tend to have a timeline let's see they also include timelines in the back so they have these for people and places and I really like the who was series so and my, my kids enjoy this as well who was King Tut Along that line, I also have this book, and I don't know why I had this book, but it's about Tut's Mummy Lost and Found. So if you have this one, that's fine. I didn't read it to my kids because it just was repetitive of what we'd read in other things, but it does have nice colored pictures in it. And um, so they just looked through it. <laughs> and we can always read it again later. We, we have it. So if you find it, it's not a bad option. This one is about Hatshepsut. Um, and it's called... Hatshepsut, His Majesty Herself. So um, I thought this was really a really well done book about Hatshepsut. I, you know, I had heard of her um, and you may have as well. She was a woman who was Pharaoh and it, it confused people for years because in documents that in documents that people wrote at the time, she was referred to as him and Pharaoh as masculine, but also sometimes as female. And so they were just confused as to who this person was, um, but she has a really interesting story. Um, and I also really loved the pictures in this book. I, I actually used this to copy for art later because I just thought it was so pretty. So I learned a lot about Hatshepsut. 
um, from this picture book. And we just, we read it in one sitting. It's a little, it's a little long because it's got the smaller um, text in it. But oh my, I love, love the pictures in this book. I, I just love these styles of pictures. I think they are gorgeous. And um, I always try to incorporate, I mean, there's plenty, we're obviously covering men in history, but men are covered much more than women just because there's more information about them. So when I can, I try to incorporate information about women as well, um, because I feel like they're often also left out of a lot of um, textbooks and traditional teachings of history. So um, you may notice that, that I'm, I'm, I've sometimes put in extra effort to make sure that we are covering women. Um, but yeah, I, I am so happy with the choice of this one because there were, I think, two or three I was debating between and this one had chef sit his, his majesty herself, Catherine M. Andronic. And it's illustrated by Joseph Daniel Fielder, which I'm sharing because I think the illustrations are fantastic. <laughs> uh, these books are bonus books and I'll explain as I go. So this is Cleopatra by Diane Stanley. And I love Diane Stanley's books. <clears throat> I was debating whether to do this in this unit and I had pulled it out and I put it on our unit shelf and so of course my kids wanted to read it and so I did and I kind of wish I'd held off until we did Rome and I will read it again for Rome but it's because Cleopatra is she's technically she's the last pharaoh but she was from the line of Ptolemies who were Greeks from so we'll, we got to this later when we covered Greece <laughs> As of the taping of this, we've already covered ancient Greece, um, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece. We have yet to cover Rome. So <laughs> when Alexander the Great died, he split his empire among several of his generals. And one of them that got Egypt was Ptolemy. And so he then founded basically like a line of pharaohs, but they were actually Greek. And so she was the last of the Ptolemies. And obviously she was very entangled with the Romans, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, if you know the story. Um, generally, Cleopatra's story is not kid appropriate, just generally. Um, but Diane Stanley, it's, I don't, I don't, I didn't find anything inappropriate about her telling of it. So I thought it was well done. And I love how she does the illustrations to match the person of the time period. So it kind of looks like a mosaic here. She looks very Roman or of that time. Um, so... My caveat is you could include this because technically she was a pharaoh, the last pharaoh of Egypt, but she was technically Greek. And during the time of the rise of the Roman Empire, I guess the fall of the Republic and the rise of the empire. So if I were to go back, I would save it for then. But you could do whatever you want, or you could just get this book and learn about Cleopatra, if you're interested. So, that's Cleopatra by Diane Stanley. This is African Beginnings, and this is not strictly on Egypt. However, we wanted to learn a little bit more about, um, specifically, Nubia or Kush, which is just south of Egypt. Um, so it was it, it was a country that um, is it's currently where I believe Sud I believe Sudan is currently what is the country that is in that area now, but they were along the southern part of the Nile, which is actually the Nile runs from south to north, and they fought with the Egyptians a lot. But sometimes, like there were Nubian, there was like a Nubian queen of Egypt, and so sometimes they were together and one country and or group of peoples and so anyway we wanted to learn more about that so i got this book and this is basically on ancient africa um and then it yeah so it has a map here and my daughter was really interested in this she just um she just is really interested in africa in general i will link here we did around the world preschool where we did geography and we went continent by continent and i will link my africa study here she loves africa and we really dived into that and so i wanted to make sure to have a little bit more for her on that a lot of ancient africa wasn't civilizations it was more like north america where there were tribes and so there's not there's not a whole lot of information there is a chapter of story in the world on ancient Africa and there's a story Anansi I think an Anansi is a tricky spider story 
so I just got this. It has, you know, a spread on Nubia and it has a spread on Egypt. So I just read those and we looked through it and uh, I think we read a couple more pages of her choice. Um, but it wasn't something we read all the way through and it's not, it has a page on Egypt, but it's not, um, it, it doesn't give like a lot of new information from all of the other resources that we have. But if you're interested in studying, especially ancient Africa, it's a good overview book. Those were all our book books. Um, we do still have some resource books that, um, all right, I'm just going to jump into those next. So this, this is Food and Cooking in Ancient Egypt. And we actually did read through this as well. There's a lot of information. Um, it's very dense and it, some of it's a little dry. It was not as interesting as our other, um, as our other books. However, it includes recipes based on these things. So what we did is we took some of these recipes. We didn't do all of them. And the kids helped me make an Egyptian meal. My daughter was in charge of the date balls, so she had to chop up a whole lot of dates, which was actually a lot harder to do than it sounds like. So we had date balls for dessert. Um, we had the duca dip that's in here with um, the bread. I made the flat bread. And I didn't have the exact ingredients that they had in this book, so I kind of just made it up with what I had. It's pretty simple, just like a flour and water bread that I, I just put on a, um, a skillet. And we made chicken kebabs. We all really enjoyed, and oh, and then I just tried to figure out what, you know, I wanted to include vegetables, so I just tried to figure out what vegetables they would have had, so I included those. And we really enjoyed the whole process of figuring this out, and I did a lot of the work of making it, but I kind of enjoyed it, and it was kind of a fun, we did it um, towards the end of our unit, so it was kind of a fun way to wrap up our unit as well. I have this Ancient Egyptians and Their Neighbors, and um, I think this has some great stuff in it. And it has the Egyptians, it also has the Hittites, the Nubians, and the Mesopotamians. So I thought it would be like a really, really good resource to do for this whole unit. And I just found myself, um, there's also a lot of information here. So it's not all, it's not all just activities, there's also information and then Within the information, let me see if we can find an example here. Within the information, there's then activity. So, so this page goes through the Egyptian architecture, and then the next page has um, a simple step pyramid. So, in all the other stuff I had, I just didn't. A lot of these just required more materials and time that I currently wanted to put in, and I might do them more when we um when we come back to the ancient world um because I'm, i am hoping to repeat the cycle again at least twice with each kid so i'll be doing it several times <laughs> um as i now have a baby so <laughs> she's gonna go through a bunch of times so i'll be going through this at least three times and thinking um but I, as at the ages they are right now and especially with having the baby a lot of this was stuff that they were going to need me to do most of the work and I just wasn't ready to do that at this point. I wanted it to be more hands-on for them. So I decided to go a different direction, but I do think that this book is well done and um, has a lot of good information in it as well. Um, and I had meant to do some of the Nubian activities, but as I said, it just was going to need too much, too much work for where I was at the time. Another one is ancient science and this is really cool. This goes through different time periods and then it has activities um, based on those time periods with information. So science from the dawn of time, the first humans, um, from the fertile crescent, crescent, ancient Mesopotamia, and then ancient Egypt is down here. So the projects they had were sticking together, pyramid power, measure up, keeping time one, and hieroglyphics. So um, let me see if I can find this for you. So for example, keeping time is actually making a sundial, which I had planned to do, and I'm gonna be honest, we just didn't get to it. <laughs> so this is a cool book, much like the other activity book I just showed you. It just is stuff that is a little too hard for a first grader and or preschooler to do on their own without a whole lot of help. So it wasn't something I was ready to do this year, but 
I'm going to save this book and come back to it because I do think it's really cool. We also use this. This is the activity book that goes with Story of the World. Um, and so they, there's one of these for each of the volumes. And the front half, I guess, goes chapter by chapter and has it has encyclopedia cross-references. So it tells you the cross-reference pages for that chapter with the Usborne Book of World History, the Usborne Internet Linked Encyclopedia, the Kingfisher Illustrated History of the World, and the Kingfisher History Encyclopedia. Then it has review questions, narration exercise. It also has lists for additional history reading, corresponding literature suggestions, map work, and then it has ideas for projects you can do, and it tells you the, the materials you would need and directions for how to do it. So example, this one is make cuneiform tablets, and this is the Sumerian chapter. And there... So these are really helpful. And I did refer to this when I was putting together the unit to get some ideas in the literature section of what she recommended. What I really use this book for is the second half, which has maps. So almost every chapter has its own map. And I didn't print out one for every chapter because some of them are the same, like for Egypt, you know, there's, um, there's only so many pictures, maps of Egypt that they need. Um, but I, what I would do is I have a, I have a, printer with a copier, um, which I made as an investment, which has been a great investment for me. And I just copy one page for each child. So I'll be able to use this book over and over again and make as many copies as I need, um, which I don't think they want you to do that for like a school setting, but I think for each family is fine. And then there's coloring pages. So for most chapters, I also try to have a coloring page. Some of them have more than one. And my kids love that. If you watched my homeschool week in the life video that I recently posted, you will see as we're doing history, as I'm reading story of the world to them, they are doing coloring pages and they get so excited when I pull them out. And history is my kid's favorite part, um, is I think both my kid's favorite part of school right now. I also occasionally pull, I also occasionally find and print out other coloring pages for them. Just look for free coloring pages online. This is my son's, I believe it was Set. As we were reading about the different Egyptian gods, he really liked Set. And so I, I found coloring pages of each of their favorite gods. And I think my, my daughter's was a goddess. I think hers was Tefnut, who has the head of a lion. So, which makes sense if you know my daughter. Okay, moving on. Artistic Pursuits, Art of the Ancient. I think I showed this in my ancient history video and possibly also in my homeschool family subjects. Um, I am working on doing a review of these artistic pursuits, uh, K through three, um, books. I have this one and I have, vol this is volume two and I also have volume one, which is not, uh, it's just general art and not tied to historical time period, but I've been using this this year and Egypt was no exception. So, um, spoiler alert to the other video. I love it and would recommend it, <laughs> but this has, um, it's not just Egypt. So but it, it has all different, it's, um, it's, it is centered around the Mediterranean. So we're coming up on doing like a little mini unit on ancient China soon. And that um, is not included in here. And I've just looked up some other things we could do for that. But it has a lot of great things in here. It has um, videos on some of the techniques that you would use. And there were two lessons on um, that were relevant for ancient Egypt here. The first lesson for ancient Egypt in here was art in pyramids. And so it just gives you some basic information on art and pyramids. And then each of them has a picture. So this one is a picture of some art that was found in a pyramid. And it describes it and tells you what it is. And then it has questions to ask the kids that just, um, they're not super hard questions. They're just mainly observational to get them, you know, really observing and looking at the piece. And then it has instructions and diagrams for how to make your own. So this is um, you make a mural. Then the next, the second lesson in ancient Egypt was art in Egyptian palaces. So same thing, it goes over this. It has art that you can look at. Um, these are nature themed. So this one is you make a garden, you paint a garden. So I kind of combined these things um, because they were so similar. A lot of the art that they found in ancient Egypt is on walls. Um, and they also had, they talked about in the garden, some of them were on actually on the ground as well. But what I did is I just put up large pieces of paper for each child on the wall 
and let them paint their own murals. Um, I encourage them, especially my daughter, to look at the themes that we saw in the art that we looked at from ancient Egypt and use those themes. And she did do that. Um, and they just had a really good time doing this. I'm excited to come back to doing some more art on the wall. We may come back to it in Rome. I got these. I believe I got them from Rainbow Resource. Again, I will have them linked below. This is a paint your own papyrus set and I got big ones which you can actually see behind me and a couple of these little ones and we didn't even finish. Um, I didn't realize how many came in a pack so um, I'm just saving them and then we can do them again later. It doesn't even have to be during an Egypt study. They were just kind of fun to paint. Um, then also I believe from Rainbow Resource, this is the Egyptian mummy dig kit. So it came as like a block of clay-ish stuff and they had to dig through and they had to find um I think they were all separate there was like the mummy and then there's the pieces of the sarcophagus and we had to clean them all off and then it came with a linen like a small not real linen but like a little pretend linen I don't even know what it is strip that um, could then wrap the mummy and then put it in its sarcophagus I found this took some finding and I'm gonna be honest i I found this, but it's missing a block or two to complete it. So I don't, I'm not going to link it below just because I haven't found the best resource. To, I, I haven't found the best source, but you could try to find it used. Um, it did look like it got a little pricey, um, but this is Haba's pyramid blocks. And I just, I think they don't make them anymore, which I think why it's so hard to find, but it's really cool. It comes, it's a set um, and it gives you instructions as to how the, to build the pyramid from the bottom up and it comes with a little sphinx and palm trees as well. And I've done it with my son twice. He needed some help, so he's four. He needs some help to do it. Um, my daughter could probably do it on her own. She just wasn't as interested. I just put it out during our unit. Um, the blocks were all out in a basket on our unit shelf. If you've watched some of my previous videos, you might've heard me mention Jim Weiss and that we love his audiobooks and we do and I found two that had to do with ancient Egypt so this is a storyteller's version of pharaohs and queens of ancient Egypt and this is Egyptian treasures mummies and myths um, so some of these some of this information was repetitive from what we read these have this one has um, stories of some of the gods in it um, which were also in I, I think there was one story that was in this in the story of the world and then also in our Egyptian mythology book. But it's like a foundational story of Isis and Osiris um, and Set and the Nile. So it wasn't a bad thing to read, to have several versions of. Actually, I did ask my children after we had heard or read the story three times if they could point out differences next time they listened to this, which they did. Um, and they just still pull these out to listen to all the time. Uh, we just, we really enjoy them. So yeah, this has um, just a couple of the myths and then it has um, information on the Pyramids Builder and the Mummy's Tomb based on a true story. Um, so that's in that one. And this one is, um, it just has information on the Nile. And then it goes through a couple famous pharaohs. So it talks about Hatshepsut, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, Ramses II. Um, it has several, a, a long thing on Ramses II. So um, we really enjoyed both of these CDs and we're still listening to them, even though it's been a while since we finished our Ancient Egypt study. And like my books, I will link them below. I believe this is the last resource I'm sharing with you for Ancient Egypt. And this is a little Ancient Egypt Go Fish game. It comes with an informational book. It just has um, pictures, information of what the pictures are on the cards. Um, we didn't really use this because we have all these other resources. But if you were just getting the game, this would be really helpful. And it might be helpful in the future when maybe we don't quite remember who all of the gods and goddesses are. So just pulling out the cards, they all look, you know, it's a game, so they all look the same on the back. And then they're numbered by different categories. And they're not, um, it's not matching, there's not like four of these pictures, but there's, I think, either four or six of each number, and it's God. Like, number one is God, so you want to match the gods. So the advanced version... It has on the bottom of the card uh, a list of all the gods. So I guess it's five that are, no, the other ones. It must be six. So I guess it's six, all of the other god cards that there are. And so in the advanced version, you ask for a specific god. So I'd be like, you know, child, do you have a, do you have Horus? 
And so maybe they have another God, but they don't have Horus. They can say, no, go fish. Um, but the way we played, we just made it really easy and simple and said, you have a God. Um, and that way also, the kids didn't need to be able to read this because they could coordinate with a number. So my son, who's four, could ask, do you have a number five? And we could say, oh yeah, that's mummies. And we could, would also talk about what, you know, what's on there. This happens to be a cat mummy. So it goes through gods, goddesses, um, symbols. Let's see. Mummies is number five. Afterlife is number six. And pharaohs is four. So it has a lot of interesting information in here. And each of the cards also has a little bit of information. So you could, you could while you're playing the game, let's say you're doing it for school time, just also read the information. Um, yeah. I love having games for school time. I've been getting more and more into using them as part of our learning. I will have these linked below, but I also want to mention that these are by Bird um, Birdcage Press. I also have some of their art games, um, and I think they do some beautiful, I think they have some beautiful products. I would be remiss if I did not mention our timeline in this video. I mentioned it in my overview of what we're doing for ancient history this year, but I did make a timeline um, starting with, starts with either 5,000 or 6,000 BC, and going to 400 AD, or I think goes to 500 AD, to cover this year of ancient history. And then I am just printing out um, little pictures of things, of people and events and civilizations, I guess, things to represent them, that um, the kids then color and we put on the timeline. Now being a little more than halfway through the year, I must say that I did not leave enough room on the timeline, so I may go back actually and double the timeline up and you'll see that as we move on during the year in my other units that we're getting quite crowded as we get closer to you know year 1 BC and AD there uh, so I may have to add more but it's been really nice to see you know kind of what order things came in and if you have any questions about this unit or any of my resources that I'm sharing please comment below and ask I love to answer questions and I always love when you give me more ideas of videos that you want to see if you haven't subscribed, please do so so you don't miss any of my new content and click that thumbs up button if you liked this. I'll talk to you later, friends.